Welcome, everybody, once again. I'm Hadley Gamble. I'm CNBC's senior international correspondent and anchor in this part of the world. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists. Um, it's going to be an interesting conversation because essentially the topic is capitalize on, capitalizing on untapped opportunities. Before COVID, it seemed that the travel agencies were going to disappear. The pure online companies were going to win the battle. After COVID, this is not the case because digital and technology are changing the rules of the game. Consumers wanted to interact with travel companies, not only online, not only online. They're expecting to interact online, but always and always complementing that online interaction to have a person, a face-to-face -face relationship. So more than ever, omnichannel is possible and is expected from consumers. That's today possible thanks to digitalization. So pure online players are not the winning players. The winning players, in our view, in the future, are pure omni-channel players, where you, as consumer, can decide if you want pure online, you get online. If you, if you want a personal travel advisor at home, you, you get a personal travel advisor at home. As consumer, 24 by 7 with you, all day, all day with you. Before your holidays, giving you some advices on what are you going to find at destination, being you with you at destination, suggesting you local activities that could bring value to you and to, and to, your, to your trip, and being with you after the holidays, 24 with you. Okay, that's, that's, that's really relevant, and this is our value proposition, to be with our customer at Viajar Corte Inglés, 40, 44 hours by seven days. So Jorge, technology. I'm sold. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want to know. No, but it's very important when we talk on technology to think on consumer. Yeah. Because sometimes companies, digitalization, CRM, What's, what's about consumer? That's, Matlab, that's I want to, uh, Fahad Omet has joined us. It's welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I want to ask Jeremy to weigh in on this in the sense of uh, how important today is the influencer? We've mm -hmm. talked about how important is the digital side of this, but how important is the influencer today? Yeah, so I think if we take a step back and maybe think about the kind of macro environment, the most important question to ask is what is the kind of content that they're consuming when they're in those places? And we saw, I think maybe three months ago, a very senior executive at Google was giving an interview at a, at a Fortune conference where he shared that it's estimated now that 40% of young travelers will not go to Google search or Google Maps to discover where to travel. They will go to TikTok and they will go to Instagram Reels and what they will see is a visual story of where they should go. Now just think for a minute what your traditional search was like when you were thinking about travel. You would go into a small square box, you would type in what you wanted to see and you'd be presented millions of results that were written text. None of those things represent the passion, the beauty, the amazing feeling that you get when you look at beautiful content in travel. And we've always been very lucky in our industry that we sell an inherently emotional and inherently passion-driven product. So why would we show that in a non-visual format if that's where consumers are spending their time? And so it was now, I think, six years ago where Facebook and Instagram started to put out usage statistics where they shared that one in every five minutes spent on mobile is spent on either Instagram and Facebook. And now in the last two years, that TikTok has emerged and absolutely eclipsed that. The starting point is understanding that consumer attention is held by the people, the brands, uh, and the ind uh, individual publications that build a brand on social. Now understanding that, the logical question then is, am I making content that resonates on these platforms? Because this is where people begin to, th uh, to think about, about travel. So influencers is, is one corner of this space. There are many, many, many corners. And as you in the room consider how you might market or how you might build your brand, I think a, a more important question is, am I creating video, which is what people are now consuming, that is vertical and fit for purpose for mobile? That is the most important thing that you can do. Yeah. Well, I'd weigh in on this in the sense that, for Saudi Arabia specifically, what are the opportunities as a direct result of the kingdom opening up and the initial interest in your mind uh, for people to see something that frankly is unlike anywhere else? Uh, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a wonderful diversity in terms of culture, climate, uh, different locations with different do's and tappers, and there's a different. Uh, uh, it's highly visual. Say, And um, uh, I will definitely incentivize uh, any visitors or any investment to think of Saudi Arabia as a whole, uh, as a comprehensive destination where you can definitely spend 
uh, uh, different timings with different experiences with different locations. But um, uh, we're transforming to create also uh, state-of-the-art destinations in, in, in several uh, locations. Um, the, uh, the nature itself with Saudi Arabia, different terrains, different topography. Um, the, the, uh, I would say most of the, uh, the opportunities uh, uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia is, is definitely fueled with passion, mm. with a lot of resources a lot of vision behind it. I think those will summarize the opportunities in Saudi Arabia. And following on to that, um, you know, if you want to think about this in a, in a more holistic sense, uh, Nikolai, for you, could you just encapsulate in, in our minds, we're talking about on CNBC so often, the price of oil, the concept of recession, what we're talking about, particularly in Europe at this point, um, how difficult the next couple of years are going to be. People are going to want an escape. How do you tap into that and at the right price point in your mind? We, we bring the world of content to, to consumers today. Uh, I, I often say that we live in the, in the world of new generations. We want and expect uh, brands that we interact with to deliver on, on our needs. And, and uh, So when we bring the world of content, we, we allow the brands to understand intimately what the reader wants, what the consumer wants, what the traveler wants, um, and to, to respond with the products and services that are fit for purpose, fit for, mm. for the circumstances, for the environment that, that, that we're in. The, um, the unique nature of content that it's, uh, is that it, it, can, it can not only inspire, but it can educate the, the, the reader today. We, we democratize access to that content, we allow the brands to sponsor access to that content. So when the reader gets access to the content and, and provides the, the valuable data to brands, the reader is not necessarily paying for it. So there is that, you know, the, the economies uh, that we, we, we're getting out of that. But at the end of the day, uh, yes, there are tough times coming, but, but it's, not, it's not global. You know, not everybody's going to go through the exact same experiences. And, and so there, there are still untapped opportunities that exist with, with those who will have money, who will want to, to travel, because there is that revenge travel that still sits, the pent-up demand is, is very strong, as we, we've talked about before. And uh, uh, for, for the brands to provide a sustainable and economic experience is something that can be achieved uh, with, with digital products like ours. Mm -hmm. And how does that challenge you across language barriers, across cultural barriers? For us, the, the key aspect was to, to provide a service that addresses all types of, of, of consumers, all types of individuals. We, uh, we bring content uh, that's published in multiple languages. We build features that allow for content to be translated into other languages. So as, a, as an English speaker who wants to know more about what's happening in, in the French-speaking world or in the Arabic-speaking world, I can use the product and I can get access to that content very, very easily, and that's the beauty of technology today. I can, I can get the perspective of what's happening in the locale before I go there from a local perspective. Not what an English language source is gonna tell me about Saudi Arabia, but what a Saudi is gonna tell me about Saudi Arabia. And that power of authenticity that comes out in, you know, in the Saudi person explaining to me, as, as Fahad was telling me yesterday about the, the beauty of Eastern provinces, something that I, I don't think I would have learned from reading an English language source. And, and thank you for sharing that story with me. And that's something that technology allows us to do. So when we can build a product that addresses uh, and, and understands me as a, as, an, as a consumer, understands me as a person, uh, despite or in spite or in, in addition to my abilities or inabilities to pay for that content and provides the or other abilities, you know, it's important to provide the service that is accessible mm -hmm. to everybody, whether they can, or they have a visual impairment or, or, or anything like that. Uh, that's how you reach <coughs> the, uh, the, the masses and you can draw them into your destinations. Mm -hmm. And that's very important for us. So about authenticity, and as Jorge was saying, about understanding for the first time ever the profile of the traveler in a way that we haven't been able to do and, in the and past. What, and what can brand learn from a profile of a tra traveler on that very, very intimate level without abusing 
privacy that comes with it, yeah. and not just learn it, but apply it into the marketing mm -hmm. spend, into building products and services mm -hmm. that come out from something that is very, very intimate to me, something that I read, I consume yeah. on my individual level. Gordon, weigh in on that one in terms of the privacy element. I mean, I think we're the least private, perhaps, we've ever been in the history of mankind. Well, <clears throat> the recent CETA survey showed that for international travel, um, we're prepared to provide our information if we get service. Yeah. Right? So we look at where are the pain points in international travel, and we heard His Excellency, Excellency making his wish this morning. Part of it was seamless travel. So how do we fill in the gaps of that? Well, we as individual consumers want a level of service. We want to have that. So are we prepared to provide some information? Often in advance, it's the same information that you would provide at a border. So if you came in, you had to pass over your passport. You had to give a picture, for example. If we can move those things a little further earlier in the process and then use that information in a properly protected way, where I, as a traveler, say, OK, I'm ready to share that now, so it's consent-based, then we can provide a level of service on arrival. So do I need to pull out my passport if you've already got my picture on all the details? You've done the checking, just like a passport reader would do. If I can simply walk up and you recognize that I'm now arrived, it's, it's going to speed the process. And that's one of the biggest areas in the CETA survey was the number, number one pain point in, in travel is borders and immigration. Right. So how do we, we through COVID have all adapted ourselves to be able to get digital services. And we're prepared to provide some information to get those digital services, knowing that there's a level of trust in the company or the government with the proper protections, the data protection laws, et cetera, and, and the building of our systems include those things. So why would we expect now that COVID is faded that we would go back, mm. right? We, we, used, we open our phones with our face. We, we go and do our banking online. Why not get other government services, for example, in borders and immigration? That's the question, though, is that it's government accountability in yeah, a sense, exactly. and whether or not they'll be willing to help the industry. Yeah. So in your mind, I mean, the Europeans come to mind immediately in terms of privacy concerns. How difficult do you think it will be in future to continue? I, I think, I think with, uh, if it's consent-based and you're following the rules of the, of the regulatory power in that region, right? There are different rules in different areas of the world. And travel, of course, you have to be accommodating of that because mm -hmm. there are subtle differences. But the good part is the European Union has placed a standard which most other countries are comparable to, at least. So if you're following that, you, you are in the right zone to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then it's a case of saying, do I consent to use my information, and how much information do I need to give you? Do you really need to have all of the things about me, or can I just consent to give you a portion of what you need for that service? And if we build our systems around that basis, I think that's a fundamental principle uh, for going forward. Yeah. When I spoke to Bill Gates just a few um, months ago, he was essentially saying to me that the world needs to be ready for another pandemic, that we have one on the way. Didn't give me any details or dates, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but that was basically the message. Um, uh, Jorge, how does that impact in your mind? Um, we, we understand so much about digitization. We understand how it's impacting the industry and how we can glean so much information from the things that are being done. But at the same point, you've got governments more involved than they've ever been before. No doubt at some point there will be pushback in terms of privacy concerns. And now you have the opportunity, frankly, to potentially plan around the next big hit to the industry. How does that affect your strategy? Yeah, I think that the privacy, data privacy, general terms, is, is really key. If today we are talking about the better future and to be responsible with the planet, with society, privacy is key. And again, consumers today and in the next future are looking for serious company, people, I'm sorry, companies that really deliver and respect people's rights, people's privacy. So for us, it's key to protect and to, to really respect in all the markets, mandatory or not, to respect privacy from our consumers and to be one of the companies more serious on how we treat our consumers in any market. We are talking in Europe, which is mandatory, but in other markets where regulation is still not, not so strong, but we think it's key, and in our strategy, reputation, and to be very honest and serious with society, respecting 
everything, including privacy, is really key. Yeah, because everything if there's a know. breach, you could be held accountable in, in multiple jurisdictions yeah. across the world. And in terms of that law enforcement, is that something that you take into account in everything that you propose? Uh, and and something, something concrete is, for example, we try to expand the practices that we are delivering in Europe, where regula regulation related to privacy is very strong, but we apply the same rules, for example, in Latin America or in the USA, where today regulation is not so strong. So we try to go uh, to anticipate what's coming, because in our mindset, consumer protection, better future, respecting consumers is really key. We yeah. want to be faster than the regulation. No doubt. Um, Jeremy, how does that weigh in your mind um, when we talk about what happens next? And I'm talking about possibility of another pandemic, recession fears, because I've read a lot of research, if, if research it can be called, on influencers and how recession is going to impact them specifically. But we understand that, especially for younger people, it's going to hit them hard. And they are the greatest consumers of the social media that we're talking about. Yeah, so I think um, it presents so many exciting opportunities when you think about people uh, in the way that they can make money. So if you look at the creator economy, you look at people that are uh, now in the travel industry driving interest, they're, they're talking about properties, they're talking about destinations, they're getting you to understand what's happening around the world. Many of these individuals now are seeing themselves as uh, mini publishers, mini media entities, where they have a following that follows them, that cares about what they talk about, they're influenced by, by what they say, these are individuals that invest very heavily in storytelling and creating content, and many of them now are doing it in a way that they can get a very impactful message across, whether it is aligning with the government and spreading information about um, COVID protocols, as an example, or it's saying going to a new hotel, and they can do it in a way that actually lands with consumers. So they land those messages in maybe six second or 15 second videos, but at the core, these are individuals and then companies and brands that really deeply understand this fundamental shift that we're seeing in the world uh, around content. Now, when we started our business, it was 10 years ago, maybe, maybe three, four months after Instagram had launched. I had probably, probably four years of coming to events like this, meeting industry leaders in travel, where there was absolutely no interest at all. And I think many of us in the room will remember what it was like at the beginning of social media, where people thought of it um, as, as not a viable business channel. Now, we spent you know, these last 10 years just investing very, very heavily in telling stories, creating content, and that is the only reason why now Beautiful Destinations is the largest travel community in the world on, on social media. There's 50 million people on Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok that come every single day to learn about where to travel, where to stay, what to do, and it's only from making content. Now, the reason for sharing that is that every single person in this room has the ability to make content. We have these devices in our hands, we've had these devices in our hands for many, many years. You can document the things that you're seeing around the world and share that content. And if you have a perspective that resonates with an audience, you can build that without the need of the traditional infrastructure, without the need of the heavy, heavy marketing spend. Um, and then it presents an opportunity for more traditional industries and more traditional um, media companies to embrace those things and, and come together. So I think even though we may see um, more challenges in our industry in the future, I think there's many, many, many new opportunities that digital and social have enabled to, to yeah. monetize and to help brands make money too. Yeah. Fahad, um, specifically to Saudi Arabia, I've been coming to the kingdom for slightly less than 20 years, but in the last three or four years, obviously, the expansion in tourism has been astronomical. It's something yeah. that, frankly, in the West, I think they were surprised, and I personally was thrilled to see. Um, how critical, in your mind, is that user-based content to Saudi Arabia's ability to draw in tourism, and I'm talking about folks on Instagram and TikTok, but also these creators of content. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it is very important. I wouldn't call it critical, to be honest, but it's very, very important to understand uh, and, and uh, what the demand is and make it, uh, I would say, uh, if I can call it user-centric kind of content. Um, in my opinion, uh, we're opening up to the entire world over the last few years so and with with the globalization and with the handheld devices and the social media now everybody knows what are the traditions of other uh, other nations and, and and other countries so you can definitely cater for their specific requirement but i think it's very critical and it, it has been taken into consideration in the itinerary design and the placemaking in all that and uh, i i believe this is one of the areas where uh, definitely yesterday uh, we have 
we have experienced Dir'iyya, for example, and it caters for every taste, actually, the, the, the music and the diversity of the music and, 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 and the food as well, and it is definitely catering for all taste. Yeah. So uh, I absolutely say it, it would be very important. For Saudi Arabia specifically, on the influencer side, you've been criticized for bringing them to the kingdom in the early days. Um, how do you respond to that? Because frankly, social media, as we know, makes everything political. Can you re rephrase the question again so <laughs> I, can, I can understand it very well? Because uh, it sounded to me like it's a very critical question, so I have to answer it precisely. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Saudi Arabia, in the early days of opening up, was heavily criticized for bringing influencers to the kingdom to, okay. to, to open up that sort of social media platform for the kingdom's content, for the places to come and visit. How do you respond to that? Because by definition, frankly, social media is very political. Definitely, if you're working against the transformation and you're serious about it, you will be criticized anyway. Uh, it's part of the transformation, I would say, life cycle. It's just like uh, uh, forming, storming, norming, and evolving. And I think that was the storming phase of the transformation of Saudi Arabia. But uh, I think we're moving ahead anyway. Uh, and I think it, it, it pays off at this moment of time. We're here today hosting the, this wonderful event with uh, a room full of uh, great people and uh, very enthusiastic about what is happening in my country. So uh, I guess uh, that was inevitable to happen. And, and I think we passed that stage. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up if I'm to keep you to time, which I've been told I have to do. Thank you so much for this panel. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Thank you.